again to give us a little protocol on COVID-19, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, good afternoon. Uh, in open session, uh, we are in stage orange and therefore we have imposed additional safety protocols for our safety and the safety of others. Uh, what, one of the key changes from our previous meetings is that masks must re remain on for the duration of the session. Uh, this is an open session. However, we have restricted the attendance of the public and the media. This session is being videotaped, and as soon as the session is complete, the videotape in its entirety will be posted onto the website unedited, and therefore that will satisfy the requirements of an open session of committee. Uh, with that, back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. So with that, uh, we've got six items on the agenda. The first is approval of the minutes. Uh, can I have someone move that for me? Thank you, Councillor Sullivan, and seconded by Councillor Reardon. All those in favor? and opposed, thank you so much. 1.2, uh, budget monitoring uh, report. I believe Commissioner Fudge is going to help us along with that one to start. Thank you, sir. Are you going? Bear with us, uh, please, Kevin. Bear with us a second, please. Thank you. Good evening, members of the committee. Common Council approved the city's long-term financial plan with goals to reduce the city's debt, aging infrastructure, and tax rate over the next 10 years. To achieve those objectives, Common Council approved a suite of best practice financial policies, including the budget monitoring policy. This policy increases budget accuracy and enhances fiscal responsibility by in integrating budget practices with the city's reserve, debt management, and tax rate reduction strategies. Tonight, Senior Finance Manager Craig Levine will introduce a new financial reporting framework to the committee and protocol based on Council's approved 2021 general operating budget that will allow the City to implement effective January 1, 2021, the budget monitoring policy. So with that, I'll turn the floor over to Mr. Craig Levine. As Commissioner Fudge said, uh, the purpose of this presentation is to give the Finance Committee a quick refresh of the budget monitoring policy and how it will relate to the 2021 operating budget. The 2021 General Fund operating budget was approved on October 26 for a total of just over $157.3 million. The budget monitoring policy was adopted on May 25th with an effective date, January 1st, 2021. Financial reporting will look much different in 2021. This will involve managing and reporting separately, personnel and non-personnel separately. This will result in increased budget transparency and performance management, as well as increasing our budget accuracy and financial control providing more fiscal oversight and increase in our financial flexibility. I also would like to note that this policy, along with our wage escalation policy, will provide best in class oversight on the city's wages and benefits. The policy application is laid out in the next two slides, which was presented to Finance Committee and Council. So I'm just gonna skip through these, as well as we gave some examples when the policy was approved back in May. So finance is looking to have the finance committee approve the 2021 operating budget as presented in appendix one and up on this slide, which separates our personnel and non-personnel budgets. And as you can see, uh, we've listed them uh, top to bottom as well as other charges you'll note, it has a $9.4 million charge and that is our special pension payments. So our recommendation is to, uh, in conclusion, the budget monitoring policy is just another tool that'll be used to allow the city to monitor its financial health annually and ensure that the goals and the strategies of our long-term financial plan are being met. So the recommendation is the Finance Committee approve the 2021 operating budget as presented tonight, separating the personnel and non-personnel costs in order to adhere to the budget monitoring policy and forward to Common Council for approval. And with that, I'll take any questions or... 
Thank you, Mr. Levine. Any questions? Councillor Reardon, first Thank up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Greg, it gives us an interesting perspective of how the money's being spent. And uh, it's curious when I look at, I mean, growth is our big thing, right? But when I look at growth and community services, we've got like only a third of the, per, of the money, 30% of the money is to personnel, whereas most of the other ones have more personnel than, uh, than non-personnel. So it gives us an interesting picture. And that should give us some interesting information as we go forward. I mean, if we are looking for growth, maybe we don't have the personnel that we need in that department. I don't know going forward. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask a quick question about was how are surpluses going to work when I read through this document? Surpluses well, shall not be reallocated to fund deficits. So is there going to be an incentive to have a surplus or not for a department? Is that an appropriate question for what we're doing today? Yeah, absolutely. I'll send that to Mr. Fudge. Commissioner Fudge? Yeah, we're, we're the, the budget monitoring policy prescribes that each wages and benefits and non-personnel costs have to be managed separately and monitored separately. Um, it takes that sort of bias right out of the picture because we're going to be looking at it over a period of time. We'll be looking at trends. And as we see permitted adjustments that need to be made because of actual spends, not on forecasts, not on previous years, but on actual spends, that will be the mechanism that will allow us to integrate those surpluses into our reserves, our debt management planning, and even tax rate reduction processes. So this is really a best practice you'd see in a lot of private corporations. Uh, they would follow this uh, with respect to the stewardship of the budget. Um, so I do think it, it incentivizes uh, you know, in terms of the goods and services, we also need to tie it to the actual service that's being provided. So it's not just a numbers exercise. We're going to look at what services we said we were going to provide throughout the budget process, and we're going to make sure that those services were provided. And if there's any surpluses that are incurring in goods and services, we're going to want to know why. Was the service not provided? Uh, and get some analysis before we make any sort of adjustments to the process. But it, is, it would be, I would consider this a very best practice policy. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Uh, I had another quick question just about it all. I was just thinking about, like it said, that uh, for vacancies, the money could be moved over, I think it said, in a situation that was uh, maybe somewhat extreme or unusual. So I guess on that, I would be, uh, I don't know how we would monitor vacancies. I can't see with these this mask on and the glasses. Um, how we would monitor vacancies, because sometimes you have a vacancy for a lot of different reasons. You know, you may be in a hiring freeze, or you may be, maybe you can't find the right person for the job. And in fact, in the heritage department, that's why you only have one heritage officer. We never did find, I don't think, anyone. And then that money's just got absorbed. So I don't want to lose personnel, because, you know, especially after that big cut to personnel. So I, I would. So first of all, one of the things that council does approve is our permitted establishment on an annual basis. So obviously we're going, to, we're going to want to see whether those positions are filled on an annual basis as they are part of the permit establishment, they are part of the budget, so we'll be analyzing that. If we saw a budget position that was approved as, a permit, as part of the permit establishment but hasn't been actually filled for three or four years, we're going to start asking some questions. You've got a budget amount in there, but you haven't filled the position. Likewise on casual positions. <clears throat> you know, a number of departments have casual budgets for wages and benefits. We want to make sure that if there's any surpluses in there, um, it's because of whether they're not actually using those or using those budget uh, or using that budget for casual uh, resources or not, and if they're not, there's no purpose of that budget. We should be modifying the budget, reducing the overall budget, which drives down the pressure on the tax rate uh, for the citizens of St. John, or alternatively provides a mechanism to uh, provide more funds to our debt management processes. So that would be the process for which we would oversee this. So it's really digging down, driving down to another layer of due diligence on the budget process. Kevin, also, will it look at and correlate that with any of those departments that have an opportunity to generate money or no? Does this work into that or no? Like I'm thinking some of those departments do have an opportunity to generate money, some of them don't. Yeah, so if there's any, you know, we would be considering all those factors when we're looking at this, uh, operational factors, business factors. Um, it's really an accountability, and not only is it an accountability framework, but it's also a transparency framework. Just tonight, the, the committee, you know, looking at it this in another way, the budget in another way, it opens your eyes a little bit. 
So it's going to provide an, a new layer of transparency with respect to our budget process. And we really needed this framework approved in this format so we can hold our services accountable to it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, city manager, do you have something to add or no? Yeah. Very good. Uh, Mayor Darling, yeah. go ahead, please. had a great policy brought to life really congratulations to staff and and committee and, and council i think this is best in class and and uh, not likely something that others have so i'm, I'm really proud of that uh, tonight thank you for the report uh, through you mr chairman to staff a couple things first of all i, I you know this for me is all about sustainability uh, it really shines a light on and breaks down our budgets into as, as presented personnel non-personnel and so on and so forth I think it's a very productive uh, report. Uh, it's going to be. Um, I, I, uh, it's going to tie to other things like our workforce report and other key documents that uh, council in the future and this one will use to, to drive discussions again on sustainability. A couple of uh, few things through you, Mr. Chairman, to the commissioner and to Mr. Levine. I, I just it's simple, small things, but you can do it probably quickly in your head, but. Uh, is there an opportunity maybe to have percentages there as well of, of total budget so you can quickly you quickly have those numbers and I wonder depending on how this is presented uh, there's a lot of questions there for me I wonder if it's presented for example online if there's either like notes to a financial audit or if I scroll over the 22 for example if I pick public works if I scroll over the 22 million dollars is there a way for me to quickly understand here's what's included in that $22 million uh, or growth in community development, you might say, wow, you know, their personnel costs are quite low. What's in that 10 million or vice versa, any of the other. So just, just curious if there's a way to present that next level of detail uh, in, in a way that folks, uh, you know, if they're inquisitive, they can just scroll over that line and it would tell them what the rest of the budget, maybe a bit more interactive. I guess I'll just leave that feedback, but this is, uh, a fantastic uh, policy brought to life. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, anyone else? No? Um, Councillor Sullivan, sorry, I didn't see your light, sir. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, just quickly, and, and really more for folks who are watching, but, um, these uh, policies that we continue to bring forward to the Finance Committee, um, and, I, and I don't say this sarcastically, I find them really exciting and very cool. One of the lines I hear all the time, or have heard, but I don't hear anymore, and this is one of the policies that means I don't hear it anymore, is that within a budget, we, we uh, rob Peter to pay Paul. And I think in the past, Not anymore. Um, yeah, it's no longer just a bucket of money that people get to spend out of, right? If, if it's your personnel cost in the department, you spend it on personnel. And if you need more money because you can justify it with a business case, we can talk about that. But I... I um, as for a rush at the end of the year to, to flatline a budget, I think this keeps that from happening. I think it really promotes good fiscal management throughout the organization. Um, and uh, yeah, it's definitely best in class. Uh, so thanks very much. Um, you know, kind of like picking your favorite player on a team. On, on, that's my favorite bit in this document. Thanks. You're welcome. No others? Okay, so again, um uh, City Manager, Commissioner Fudge, uh, Mr. Levine, thank you so much. Uh, this, this, I, we brought this to life uh, very early summer and implementing it in the 21 budget is just, uh, it's fantastic. Just, an, just another feather in your caps. Again, I thank you for, uh, for, for, um, for all of these policies. So, With that, there is, a, uh, there is a recommendation that we approve and take to Council. It's, thank you, Councillor Sullivan. Do I have a seconder, please? Sean, thank you very much. Councillor Casey, um, all those in favor and Aye. opposed. Thank you. Carried. Uh, item 1.3, uh, Province of Brunswick 220 COVID funding. Um, again, Commissioner Fudge, are you going to help us out with that? You're presenting. Thank you, sir.
Thank you. Uh, first of all, I believe this report is quite self-explanatory. Um, the province announced in late October uh, financial support to municipalities to cover COVID-19 related financial net impacts through the safe restart agreement with the federal government. On November 6, the province provided further instructions on how municipalities can apply for that funding, which included a requirement for a council resolution that clearly outlines the net impact with a submission deadline of December 31st, 2020. Before you this evening is the proposed City of St. John submission for the Safe Restart Funding Agreement in the amount of $3,376,725, for which $2,151,725 relates to the General Operating Fund, and $1,225,000 relates to the Water Utility Fund. Included in that number is provisions for lost parking revenues, water revenues, user fees associated with recreation, as well as additional costs as a result of the COVID-19 event. For example, materials such as plexiglass, masks, sanitizers, signage, um, you know, uh, IT uh, remote access licenses. Any savings the city achieved as a direct result of being in COVID environment, such as just by virtue of having less fuel that needed to be used, um, lower energy, uh, reduction in labor that was specifically as a result of not providing services due to COVID, that was reduced or uh, it was treated as a reduction in the formula. So first of all, the, first of all this, uh, this recommendate, recommendation tonight is, is a two-part recommendation. The first recommendation in the report is for the Finance Committee to approve the claim before you this evening and to set it, send it to Council for approval as required by the province as they require that resolution. The second half of the recommendation is for the committee to direct the, the Mayor to send a letter to the Premier to request that the province agree to amend the short-term funding agreement for the year 2020 to allow the City of St. John to retain any approved COVID-19 safe restart funding as a result of this application. As the committee is aware, through regular financial updates we provide to this committee all year, that the city took immediate action to mitigate COVID-19 losses by adjusting our service levels that impacted the community and curtailing its uh, spending to the tune of almost $5 million. Those service adjustment savings were mostly not related to organic savings because of COVID-19, but were deliberate decisions to ensure the city did not end 2020 with a monumental operating deficit. We recommend that the mayor in a letter request the province recognize the city's strong fiscal management in this regard and amend the short-term funding agreement to allow the city to retain these funds, which would otherwise likely be deemed ineligible to be retained pursuant to the funding agreement, the short-term funding agreement. If approved, we would recommend the, the funds be placed in a city's reserve to support the objectives and the goals identified in the city's 10-year long-term financial plan. So with that, I would be uh, pleased to answer any questions the committee may have. Thanks, Commissioner Fudge. Uh, questions? Um, Councillor Reardon, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kevin, how likely is it we'll get what we've requested? I mean, they've got 41.1 .1 and we're the only province, I guess, that has to provide a resolution, um, you know, to the, to, its, to the leadership of the province to get the cash. So is it likely we'll get the cash? Are we, you know, I mean, and, and then when you talk about this, I'm assuming that this 3.3, I mean, if we went with the $54 per head that the federal government was recommending, we'd be up around 3 point, maybe 6 or 7 million. Yeah, I mean, this is based on our actual results year to date. So we're in the right. neighborhood, we're in the ballpark. I have uh, quite high confidence that they'll accept this as our, our losses. We, you know, through coordination already with uh, provincial uh, officials, you know, it's, our information has been very transparent all year round. Uh, and there's nothing that uh, I guess that we haven't discussed in open session. So I feel, feel very comfortable uh, that they'll accept the application amount. Um, what I'm, I'm sure of is whether uh, the mechanisms that are within the 2020 short-term funding agreement uh, would be triggered that would 
require us to have to give the money back, which is why we're making the second part of that recommendation to request amendment to the funding agreement to allow us to retain that and recognizing that we would be retaining that because we made the right decisions to be uh, responsible, fiscally responsible in the year 2020. I guess, I mean, everyone recognizes that there were not only losses, but as you say, uh, costs incurred with COVID. So it would be only reasonable to try to, you know, mitigate that. So hopefully that will all, that will all go through. And, uh, what, and what did you say our projection was if we had not um, made some adjustments? Yeah, or so if we hadn't have done the mitigation actions that this council has done, we were uh, in the order of somewhere between four to five million dollars in potential risk of being in an operating deficit by the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, for transit, we were in the same, same boat, of course, and had to mitigate that. And, and, and people felt that reduction in services. So, you know, it's a, it would be reasonable. And I would hope that the province would understand what the municipalities have had to do to get to where we are and try to save this, uh, save this ship as we go forward. All right, I appreciate the work in that and appreciate uh, both uh, the uh, letters to the, to the province as well. Thank you. City Manager, you have something to add? Uh, you, uh, Mr. Chair, if I could. Um, the CFO mentioned how we believe that it needs to be uh, recognized as a separate pot of money from the interim funding. Um, and he's explained some of the reasons why. I think there's an even more compelling reason that we have not put on the floor yet, and that is that COVID will continue to be with us in January. And therefore, if we get this restart funding in 2020 and it gets clawed back under the interim funding formula, then we have nothing in terms of a reserve to deal with COVID in 2021 and beyond. Uh, so that's the other part of the argument as to why we believe it needs to be a standalone a uh, pot of money, if you will, and not tied to the interim government funding that ends on the 31st of December. Point well made. Councillor Casey. Chairman, um, I just have a question on, uh, does, does this include anything about uh, rent that we might not be getting from businesses or anything like that? Yeah, actually part of the, uh, the losses that we were submitting is lost revenue that we've, uh, for example, for the city market, some of the revenues that some of the businesses have, that have uh, closed or revenues that we would have budgeted for that we didn't receive this year, that would be part of the, of the submission. Okay, thanks. Mr. Chairman, what, I have a question when you... Yeah, and Mayor Darling, yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I guess maybe just more, more a couple of comments. First of all, I think, uh, thank, thank you for the, the work, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Fudge, I, I think from my perspective, the, the province and the, this premier really appreciate strong fiscal stewards. And I think that's absolutely what, um, you know, what the city has been. So I'm, I'm really hoping that the letter uh, will be supported, that our request to have, um, you know, our agreement for our 2020 funding support amended would be supported. And uh, I think we've worked really hard uh, as, a, as a council, obviously with the work done by staff uh, to rein in these, uh, these challenges this, uh, uh, this year and um, you know certainly appreciate the support that uh, the province has provided us and I hope that they will uh, they will agree to that uh, that amendment so that, those are my comments thank you Mr. Chairman thank you anyone else all right I'll just close it up by again saying thank you and you know it wasn't for um, if it wasn't for I believe staff's direction and some tough decisions made by this council that you know this number as Commissioner Fudge just said, could be as much as two million dollars higher. So we, we did do the, uh, we did make the tough decisions and do the right things, I believe. So uh, again, um, committee, there is a recommendation. Um, uh, it's two parts. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, um, one motion. I think we'll, we'll cover it if uh, I may. So uh, moved by Councillor Sullivan, seconded by uh, Councillor Casey. On the question, all in favor? Aye. And those opposed? Mm -hmm. Carried. Thank you so much. Uh, 1.4 is the uh, 2021 industrial water budget. Uh, Mr. Mason, are you with us? Yes, thank you. Kendall. You want to introduce? Thank you, Commissioner. Please. Good evening, uh, 
Mr. Chair, members of Finance Committee, this evening, uh, Mr. Kendall Mason, Director of St. John Water, will be presenting on the 2021 East and West Industrial Water Budgets. As committee will recall, this council established bylaw rates for each of our industrial water users for the first time a year ago for the 2021 year. There are no longer special agreements or negotiated water rates. This rate setting process is the industry standard across North America and ensures the customer in this case, industry pays their full cost of service. All costs and revenues are tracked separately. There is no subsidization between potable and industrial customers. The cost of service is transparent. Rates are set for full cost recovery. And this process supports Council's priority as it relates to fiscal responsibility. And it is an industry best practice. Lastly, I would note that um, in the, rec the recommendation will change slightly from what's before you. Instead of uh, submitting it to Council, the budget at its next meeting for approval, we instead uh, intend to bring it forth on December 7th uh, meeting of Council. Uh, and with that, I'd turn it over to Mr. Mason. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Your Worship, Mr. Chairman, and members of the Finance Committee. Tonight, we'll be presenting the 2021 Industrial Raw Water Budgets. Full separation of the potable industrial water system, water supplies was achieved with the completion of the Safe Clean Drinking Water Project. In 2019, raw water rate analysis was completed for the East St. John Water Industrial System and the West St. John Water Industrial System. And those uh, customers that are on that system are Irving Pulp and Paper and NB Power on the West System and Irving Paper and Irving Oil Refinery on the East System. For, for 2020, Common Council set industrial water rates for the four large industrial users, Irving Oil Refinery, Irving Pulp and Paper, Irving Paper, and Colson Cove. Each industrial water customer is billed full cost recovery for providing raw water to that specific customer. And the raw water billing consists of operating costs, debt, which is fiscal services, a contribution to asset management, and a rate stabilization reserve. <clears throat> the raw water, the rate setting approach includes uh, consumption charge and a fixed bi monthly charge. The consumption charge is made up of the, the full operating costs the fiscal services, and the contribution to asset management. Presented on the screen is the 2021 uh, operating costs and fiscal costs and asset management costs for the East Industrial System. These costs are divided between Irving Oil and Irving Paper based on the volume of water used in previous years. <clears throat> and and specific assets that these industrial users use solely. The operating costs are presented in the top of the table, number one, fiscal services is two, and the asset management component three, rate stabilization reserve, you can see in the table is four. And at the bottom of the table, we present the, uh, the consumption charge. So for Irving Oil, the consumption charge proposed is 27 cents a cubic meter with a fixed bi-monthly charge of 21,983. For Irving paper, it's six cents a cubic meter, approximately six cents a cubic meter. And for Irving paper, the fixed bi-monthly charge is $3,424. Presented on the screen is the West Industrial Raw Water Costs. <clears throat> the, 
The West Industrial Railroad costs are divided between Irving Pulton Paper and NB Power based on, again, the water, volume of water each customer used over the previous years and specific assets that each user uh, benefits from. Again, the costs are presented, operating, fiscal services, asset management, and rate stabilization. So Irving Pulton Paper, their consumption charge is 6.7, roughly 6.7 cents a cubic meter. Irving Pulton Paper's fixed by monthly charge is 43,000 by monthly. NB Power, it's 38 cents a cubic meter, and their bi-monthly charge is $1,300. So when you compare 2020 to the calculated 2021 rates, uh, <clears throat> Irving Paper has, uh, the Irving Oil is, has a slight increase, and Irving Paper has a, a greater increase, and it's two reasons for that increase. Uh, Irving Paper, there is new assets that are, have been turned into uh, service, the Robertson Lake Dam, the Latimer Lake Main Dam, and the South Dam. So all those assets are now part of their, their debt and are now being charged in the 2021 operating budget. <coughs> There's also a fixed charge that is proposed for the 2021 uh, operating year. This charge is a connection charge that may occur if both Irving, Irving Paper and Irving and the City of St. John agreed to move the, forward, the project forward. And this would connect Irving Paper to the East Industrial Pipe System. And comparing the 2021 calculator rates to the 2020 rates for the West system, uh, Irving Pulton Paper is uh, pretty much the same as 2020. Uh, NB Power sees an increase, and it's uh, for two main reasons. Number one, there's capital work that's required immediately over two construction seasons to work on their 24-inch raw water transmission main. And that results in roughly a $38,000 charge uh, for 2021. Also in 2020, their billable water consumption uh, was greatly reduced. And as a result, uh, when calculating the rates this year, the consultant utilized a three-year water usage average, and thus their uh, dollar per cubic meter increase. <clears throat> In the end, NB Power sees roughly a thirty-eight to fifty thousand dollar increase. So the recommendation is that the Finance Committee approve the 2021 industrial raw water budgets as presented and submit, submit with the 2021 utility fund operating budget to Common Council at the, the December 7th meeting of Common Council. For approval and first and second reading of the bylaw amendments. Thank you, Mr. Mace. We'll, um, any questions, concerns? Uh, again, first up, uh, Councillor Reardon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Kendall, thanks for the presentation. Um, when I read through this, my, this is listed page 26, but it's probably page 4. Yeah, it is page 4. It says the assets utilized by the East St. John Water Industrial Water System has a replacement value of $108 million. Okay, it's shown in the table, which you showed us. Uh, of table two, the total amount is 15.6 million related to infrastructure, which is which directly provides raw water uh, service to the area. What does what's the definition of directly provides? So, for example, any of the pipe system that would Irving Oil Refinery would so Irving Oil is the only industrial user that would benefit from the, the pipe system, and so they're 
they would uh, be a benefit and that would be included in their asset uh, management component of their cost. Okay, so that's, uh, that's called, um, that's related, so that's their direct infrastructure. But then out of the total amount of um, the, uh, the assets, it says the assets utilized by the East St. John Water Industrial Water System has a replacement value of 1.8. So would they be coming off of the, of the uh, shoulder system or the system that would support them? Does it just go directly straight to them? Do they use, I guess what I'm looking at when I see this, it says here, um, shared industrial and citywide infrastructure, which leaves us with uh, the annual provision of $900,000 versus 131 for Irving Oil, 139,029. But I couldn't say that I only want to, I don't only want to pay for the asset that comes directly to my home because I have to get the water through the rest of the system the support system and then the piece that comes from my home to your, to your system. So uh, it, it, right. it, maybe I can explain it a water. little bit better. Okay, I'm just so, wondering. <laughs> so uh, the watershed is something that benefits the, the watershed, which includes dams and various intake pipes. That benefits potable users and industrial users like Irving Oil. So that's a shared asset. A dam is a shared asset between potable and industrial. Some of the transmission piping is also a shared asset, benefits both potable and industrial users. Eventually it gets to a point where there's just pipes solely dedicated to Irving Oil and they would be the sole beneficiary and charge the full cost of those, the piping, the asset management component. Any shared asset, it's broken down based on the volume of water used. So if like a customer uses 60% of the water, another customer uses 40, that's how you'd be charged based on the 60-40 split. So they are, uh, they are contributing to the shared assets as well? They would be, yes. Okay, so now does industrial water all come through the same size line? I know Colson Cove, have, Colson Cove has a 24 inch line. That's, I think I read that in here, that's huge. but. Would everybody else have a certain size of line? Uh, so basically the sizing of the line depends on the volume of water needed, but Irving Pulp and Paper has a 60 inch line that's solely dedicated to them. Colson Cove has a 24 inch line solely dedicated to that yeah, so Colson Cove, but there's a pump station at Musquash that benefits both of those users, but it's charged, allocated based on the volume of water, 98, 2%. And the volume, the, oh, sorry, the volume of water is predicated based on the, uh, on the diameter of the line? No, it's based on measured, have, measured volume. So measured we have volume. meters, so. So everybody would be on a meter then? Yes, all the industrial customers are metered. Okay, because I thought there was a differential for a small business if you went with a, you know, a, a, a bigger, like a two or three inch line versus a smaller line in the, in the city. Yeah, th those are potable, Potable, the potable consumers. Stuff. Okay. All right. And then the other question I have for you is uh, on the next page it says, Hemson, um, implementing the full cost recovery of asset management provisions may place undue burden on raw water customers in the short term. Therefore, this is the recommendations. So, how do you get up to 100%? How long? So initially it's a 20% mm -hmm. asset management allocation. And again, that was because the first time we did asset management allocations is in 2020. Right. So as, uh, as we move forward, uh, the way uh, the uh, rate uh, consultants explain it as some of the debt will come down and then your asset management component comes up. So they have uh, quite a bit of debt remaining from various other projects that were completed in the past. So now as that debt drops down, our asset management component goes up and then we do more of a pay as you go or we have it in the bank and then we pay. Okay, because I guess I see like the city having um, an undue burden of water historically. Um, so I'm just curious as to when this, because it suggests that it be, it'll go up to 
up 20%, but then is it 20% over every year for five years? Is it? And, and so that's the asset management component, and that's mm -hmm. for projects that are likely to be completed in 50 years' time or that time frame. There's another piece, for example, uh, the musquash project, which is soon <laughs> to be occurring. That repayment is based on a 10-year payment repayment. Okay. Uh, so I guess it depends. And again, the other example that I just spoke about was the the line to Colson Cove, that repayment's based on a four-year repayment plan. And so the idea is to eventually move these customers so that they're paying a lot more in asset management up front so that we have the reserve money prepared right. in the okay. event that something needs to be replaced. Right, so it will depend on the project and the time of the project, yeah. length of time. Okay. That's cool. it for me, Kendall. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Did the commissioner have anything to add? I see his light on. I don't know whether. No. Fine. Thank you, sir. Then I'll go to uh, Councillor Casey, please. No, I don't share. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you can you explain a little bit why uh, Irving Pulp and Paper went down in in their rate? So um, the utility as a whole has. Uh, reduced its manpower. Uh, there's been several members of staff that have left our department in 2020. And a result of those, uh, some of those reductions that we put into effect, the overall cost for the entire utility has dropped slightly. And, and that, some of that costing is, was attributed to Irving Fulton Paper. So it's a slight reduction. Mm. to get on that on telling people that because I don't think people are going to understand <laughs> so so as the uh, so as the, the the entire cost of the system came down the portion that uh, IOL paid came down slightly very very slightly right. as well so the biggest component that <clears throat> uh, sorry just show the West costs so the operating costs for IPP, that first section, that uh, that's really the only piece that changed in doing the calculation. There was a slight reduction in the fiscal services, services, but asset management wouldn't change at all. So that's the the operating cost that was uh, attributed to them as slightly reduced in 2021. All right, thanks. Councilor Norton? You no, know, going through this, like, I, um, it's going to sound ridiculous. It's my, it's my uh, they're all great reports. It's my favorite report. And I guess the reason why is because if you take time, you really understand um, what's entailed in calculating the costs. And I think that's one of the, it's the, it's, it's not an overly dense report, but what it does provide, I mean, one of the one of the interesting paragraphs for the for the public's benefit is raw water and potable water are quite different in quality and in complexity of infrastructure and servicing requirements needed to provide the different services period like you as soon as you read that that should prompt you to take a deeper dive into the report to just to just understand the complexity of um of of what of what entails to deliver those services i mean you go even when you get into the report um you detail precisely what infrastructure is included um you talk about the fact that maintenance of watersheds so the human the human piece of that maintaining those watersheds is is calculated into it um dams you break it all down really really nicely i guess um for 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 average joe citizen are they going to take a are they going to take a look at this i wish they would i mean because if they did they'd understand exactly how we get to those costs i think the messaging out there is industry gets free water and citizens pay a heavy rate that's that's not that's not the case um the case is that this is a this is uh, the, the, the industrial user 
it's a, the, the cost to deliver the service is exactly what they pay. And I think that's legally binding as well. Um, although I'm, I'm, I'm sure that our, our, uh, our, our chief counsel um, could, could tell us that, that those are, those are decisions that are well outside the scope of the municipal authority to change, that it's a cost recovery scenario that we're looking at. And um, how we message how we how we message that to the broader public, I think will do us do us a favor from a utility and from a civic perspective, but understanding exactly what that what that cost recovery scenario looks like, is is really detailed really well in this, um, and it's detailed precisely how you how you how you get to how you get to those final numbers, what those big industrial players. Um, end up paying in comparison to, um, you know, the residential user. Um, so it, there's, it, it's, it's great education, um, I guess, from my standpoint, any advocacy or any, I guess, any encouragement I can, I can lend to the public to take a look at this so that they understand how we generate those, um, those costs and uh for for those for those big players in comparison to the people that get, that get that sticker shock that still exists absolutely we need to get those down but this is um these one of these things is not like the other it is comparing apples and oranges and uh we have to we do have to understand that how these um how this how we finally get to this uh how we get to these rates and uh so thanks for the report that's my rant and i'm gonna i'm gonna be quiet now Thank you, Councillor Norton. Uh, Mr. Mayor, do you have anything to add? Sorry, go. No, I was just wondering, uh, Mr. Mayor, if you had anything to add. Oh, yeah, sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I do. Uh, actually, I was on the exact same wavelength as uh, Councillor Norton. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, I, I, I wrote down, Councillor, I think this is a communication challenge and opportunity. It's, it's, it's quite complex, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be even more blunt uh, than, than you were, uh, Councillor, uh, you know, uh, leading up, and we've seen it. We've seen articles written that either folks don't understand or they do understand, and they're, they're trying to rev up and kick the hornet's nest. Uh, this is a topic, water, water rates. Uh, you know, let's start from the basis that we have, um, uh, I think, a, a water system that should be the envy of uh, certainly this region. It's safe, it's clean, uh, it, you know, uh, we've invested heavily hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, you know, through the last council's uh, focus and, and this council's continued focus in, in the safe, clean drinking water. Before that, it was harbor cleanup. And, and folks just don't understand. So we've seen articles uh, written where if we just buy the swipe of a pen, we charge some of the industrial folks 40, 50, 60 cents per cubic meter, all of our problems would go away. And uh, that's misleading to the public. Uh, we can't do it. Um, so, you know, building on what Councillor Norton has said, I think somehow maybe city manager and commissioner, a one pager uh, that tries to explain, um, you know, where, where we are and, and the rules and how we set the water rates, understanding that everybody, I think, around the horseshoe uh, wants to eventually see, um, you know, some relief come uh, for, for water. But it's set uh, now by a bylaw, not in private meetings. All of the costs are accounted for. Uh, it's uh, by legislation that water is not for profit and that the two entities, uh, both industrial and raw versus the potable uh, water, have to be separate. Um, and uh, I, I just think uh, anything that we can do, as Councillor Norton said, to explain, take this slide deck, which some in fairness would say is quite technical, and break it down for folks. And uh, it, it, my last comments, everything is interwoven and interconnected. So the more people that we get uh, uh, moving into the city, using our water utility, uh, you know, we'll, we'll bring eventually some reprieve. It's a, so growth matters, cost control matters, and, and as elected officials in particular, uh, and, 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 and prospective elected officials next May, not, not messing with people, not lying to them, not suggesting we can just swipe a pen and charge one rate payer over another some exorbitant new amount of money uh, when we can. So uh, thank you for the report, and uh, I, I would like to, 
you know, challenge, I guess, or ask our commissioner and our city manager to perhaps work on a, a one pager or something like the other amazing one pagers that we have about our operations. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I agree with both you and Councillor Norton. It's a well-written report. It's, uh, it explains it very well. It should be accessible to, um, to the public. We are passing on the true cost to the appropriate water users. This is, this is a user pay system, and this is exactly what the report is telling us we're doing. Um, and we're also, I'm very pleased to say, um, we've got a rate stabilization uh, uh, reserve in here of some $400,000 in this budget, which is unfortunately probably not enough, but it's a great place to start. Thank you all for that. So with that, no further uh, comments, uh, concerns. Uh, we do have a motion on the floor to, uh, to um, uh, finance committee uh, approve the 21 industrial water um, budget and present it um, and submit the 21 utility fund operating budget to council at its next meeting for first and second reading. Will someone move that for me, please? I've got uh, um, Mr. K uh, Councillor Casey, then uh, seconded by Councillor Norton. On the question, all those in favor? Aye. And uh, opposed? Carried. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mason. Uh, 1.5, um, Ernst & Young's uh, operational audit update. I believe the city manager, Mr. Collin, will you help us with that? Mention it if you're not here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sorry about that. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of committee, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I am presenting this this evening because our director of corporate performance, who would normally be in front of you this evening to present uh, this particular agenda item, also happens to be our CIO. And uh, her focus is, of course, on the cyber attack at this point in time. And therefore, I will be the representative from the staff to give you this very important update However, uh, from the outset, I would like to stress that what you are receiving here this evening is the result of many months of work in terms of analysis by the staff on the Ernst & Young report. Uh, this will be a rather lengthy briefing, uh, quite frankly, deservedly so. This is an effort that cost over $300,000 to put in place, uh, a report that was well over 100 pages with quite a bit of material within it and therefore uh, it behooves us to spend some time talking about it and uh, the future of it. Um, before I start going through the slides, some additional introductory comments. I will mention to all of you that there is nothing surprising in the final report. Nothing surprising in the final report. Generally speaking, there are two ways to do an audit such as this one. The first way, uh, which is not the best way, 
is to simply allow the auditors to come in, allow them to search for whatever they want to search for, try to find data, try to draw conclusions, and then you sit back and you wait to see what kind of findings they come up with. The second way, the far more productive way, is the one that the staff, I'm quite proud to say, embraced, and that is to say up front, instead of them having to search the data, provide all the data to them. Also, provide views on where we can improve and where we think we should improve and what our plans for doing that are. That gives the audit team a tremendous head start for them to then conduct their own analysis, not take us at face value, but at least they are not starting from a blank sheet of paper, and therefore you get much more significant results. EY, Ernst & Young, obviously did their own analysis, and for the most part, they agreed with our preliminary thoughts, ideas, and suggestions for the future. In some cases, they went further than we thought uh, would be appropriate, or identified other considerations with which we ne did not necessarily agree. But again, in those cases, we were not surprised because uh, throughout the process, we shared information, we shared those thoughts, and in fact, we shared several iterations of the report before the final version was uh, offered to the public. Put in short, the collaborative nature of this audit is commendable and I would certainly like to recognize the staff for being so willing to um, have all of their work examined and so uh, equally willing to receive the constructive criticism. I would also like to upfront recognize the staff not only for their attitude but for their hard work to provide all the data, to be involved in all the interviews, to respond to all the questions, and to be involved in some of the analytical work took hundreds of hours of staff time at a period last year, if you recall, when we were rather busy doing other things as well. So with that as a preamble, and forgive me for uh, speaking for so long on that, but I think it was important to make the point, I'll now go through the presentation. First of all, Council resolution on the 4th of May endorsed the operational audit, primarily for the reasons that I just mentioned, and directed me as city manager to develop a five-year implementation plan for the recommendations within that audit. One of the uh, powerful messages that is a recurring theme throughout the audit is this notion of the city's on the right track. And Ernst & Young certainly validated that in several locations throughout the audit. You see some of the quotes on the right-hand side. Uh, for the benefit of those who cannot read the screen, I just want to read the last quote. Uh, the other ones simply reinforce it. But I, and I quote, the city has already embarked on several of these opportunities as noted. The city identified many opportunities, implemented significant changes to their financial principles and policies, and developed a long-term financial plan. Their planning has allowed them to make great strides towards sustainability that they should continue to drive with the support of council. In short, there is a recognition throughout the report that we are on the right track. That said, as with anything, there are areas for improvement. In total, there are 75 recommendations that we have identified within the report. They're not listed as such, they're more listed in terms of focus areas, but when you go through page by page and identify them all, there are a total of 75. I will tell you that of those, 46 of those recommendations are either complete or well underway in terms of implementation. There's another 18 that are either planned or require a little bit more due diligence before we launch in a particular direction. And then there are a small number, 11, where we believe an alternative approach is required, or quite frankly, we simply disagree because either will of counsel has already been expressed, or legislative requirements would not permit us to do what they're suggesting, or some other reason why we, we believe we need to strive for an alternative method to achieve the end game. This slide here tries to capture some of the recurring themes, some of the key findings throughout the report. I'm not going to speak about each of the bullets in turn, but I do want to make a couple points about some of these bullets. The first bullet, 
uh, where Ernst and Young suggest that we need to focus more on data analysis, get more ability to measure our outputs. We certainly agree. And you will find that that is a focus in 2021 to develop that entire performance management framework for the city. Right size and divesting properties and assets. I will simply make the point now, I'll make it again later, uh, as a cautionary tale that selling a piece of property gives you an influx of money once. It's not recurring. It does not truly help you in terms of long-term sustainability. And yet you have lost the assets. So there certainly is a balancing act there and you do not want to divest too much. And that requires certainly a great amount of analysis. Um, the notion of increased flexibility in collective agreements, we certainly agree. However, it's important to remember that collective agreements are done through collective bargaining and you don't get everything you want in one round of collective bargaining. So I make the point here that although this is a five-year implementation plan, this is certainly one of the items that will go beyond the five-year mark in terms of successfully addressing or, or increasing the flexibility within our collective agreements. Investing on infrastructure is also a key point. And again, we agree. Uh, we have a very significant infrastructure deficit within the city, and we should never lose sight of that as we move forward. Uh, we, we not only need to live within our means, we not only need to reduce our debt, we also need to address our aging infrastructure. The rest of the comments on the other side are pretty much self-explanatory. Uh, I will mention, because again, it is a recurring team, that we are undergoing a fundamental review of our ABCs. There is a tremendous amount of work there. We've only begun, and, but you will see that as a recurring theme throughout the report, that there is potential to do things better, quite frankly, in terms of agencies, boards, and commissions within the city. Uh, these particular points, three points, are additional context on the findings, and each of them bears a bit of an explanation. Uh, the report does focus on this notion of we should focus on the big stuff and not worry about the small stuff. Truly put our emphasis on the transformational reforms. We agree, but only to a point. The transformational reforms, reforms are fundamental to our long-term success. However, sometimes those small changes matter just as much to an organization. And I will give you one example to make the point. The fact that we have now gone to an integrated customer service approach will dramatically enhance customer service. But in terms of a long-term sustainability, it's not a major reform that will reap great dividend. So we do believe that focus on the major reforms is important, but we also believe that some of the smaller items are equally important. The second point on this slide is this, the issue of benchmarking. It is clearly identified in the report, but it bears reminder here today. Benchmarking has its purpose, without doubt. Benchmarking is a very valuable tool, but benchmarking is problematic in that you're never sure whether you're measuring apples to apples. And I'll give a simple example. If you were to benchmark the amount of money we spend on road repair compared to other municipalities, we know what we include in that budget line item, but do all the other municipalities that we are comparing ourselves to include vehicle and equipment depreciation, miscellaneous materials other than the asphalt itself, such as paint, such as cleanup materials, et cetera, et cetera. We don't know the, with precision whether or not we are comparing an apple to an apple. But we strongly support it, in fact, ask that there be a major benchmarking part of this report, because what benchmarking does do is identify the possibility or target areas for examination. All right, but ex precise conclusions from benchmarking alone is problematic, and the report does stress that. Further analysis is always required after you do benchmarking. The final point that we wanted to put up front, there is this notion that we could make money uh, by, through St. John Water in terms of uh, some sort of revenue stream. The legislation categorically simply does not allow that. 
uh, St. John water or the provision of water must be a cost neutral uh, endeavor. And I simply mentioned that up front and it will come back as I talk through some of these other initiatives. When the staff got together to prepare this implementation plan, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, it has been a deliberate effort over the space of the last four to six months. Uh, every part of the organization was involved. Uh, it began with a review of the findings and the recommendations, and quite frankly, it began with compiling all the recommendations that are throughout the report. Uh, and then uh, many discussions and analytical work to determine what actions were the most, uh, what analysis was required and what actions were required by the city. But also we needed to go through a prioritization exercise. We have no hope of uh, enabling or completing all of the recommendations within a year long period. There is simply not the capacity to do so and quite frankly, some of these things, because they require changes to legislation, chamber changes to collective agreement, et cetera, they will take time. And therefore, we did go through a prioritization effort. This next slide, I believe, is an equally important one in terms of managing expectations. Uh, we have grouped all of the recommendations between short-term, mid-term, and long-term initiatives. Some of the things that where I, I would want to manage expectations are shown on the left-hand side of this slide. The first one is uh, EY did put some dollar figures beside each of their large focus areas. Um, some of those dollar figures, of course, uh, through a refinement process will be adjusted. Um, and some of the dollar figures have some assumptions tied to them that often get lost when you just look at the dollar figure. For example, they say that if you sold uh, all of the surplus land, you could make X millions of dollars in revenue. Well, that of course, and they, they identify within the report, that of course assumes that there's a demand for that land. Um, so I, I just caution about those quantitative values in terms of the savings. Uh, the second aspect is an equally important one. Ernst & Young approached this from an audit point of view. They did not necessarily approach it from a community perspective. And for example, they suggest within the audit report that we could sell Tucker Park. I'm sure we would have to have discussions with the community in terms of prioritization of what we do and do not sell before we just go ahead and sell Tucker Park. So the community aspects of this are not considered within the report. Uh, the other ones I think are uh, pretty much self-explanatory. I do wanna highlight the last one. Much of what is suggested within the report would require legislative change or support from the province. And therefore we are not the masters of our own destiny in terms of many of the recommendations. With that, I wanna go through the short term uh, recommendations and our implementation plan for them. Uh, for these next slides, because there's a lot of them, I don't plan to go through every one of the recommendations in turn. I will just make some general comments. Um, I will mention on this particular slide, the, the development of a strategic plan is underway and this is going to be a major effort through the remainder of 2020 and, tw and the first half of 2021 and that has already been briefed to council. For fire, you see some recommendations here. You will see some others later on. Uh, these three particular ones for fire have already been addressed pretty much in their entirety. Uh, our medical calls have already gone down by over 60%, closer to 70% because of adjustments in the criteria we use to deploy or to respond to medical calls. So that one is for all intent and purpose complete, except for some miscellaneous continuous improvement, adjustment to the criteria, et cetera, moving forward. We have also put in place several cost recovery initiatives. We are not done there. We believe there's still more to do, especially in terms of industrial response, et cetera, and that, that will be work that will be ongoing. On this next slide, uh, civilianization in the police force, 
The, those that can be changed in the short term are already complete. With regards to St. John Energy, this is an important file that will be in front of council over the coming weeks and months in terms of how do we enable a dividend flow from an incredibly capable utility uh, into the city. And I would also draw your attention that the last one on this slide is already underway and the new Regional Economic Development Agency will stand up on the first of the year. In terms of municipal lands, the first one is a, an, an interesting comment. They do not feel that we advertise our land that is available for sale as well as we could. We, we've noted that. Uh, Develop St. John does now have a land registry of everything that is for sale, and we are taking a look at ways to better advertise the sale of the lands that we are ready to divest ourselves of. The next one speaks about St. John Energy reducing its workforce. I'll, I'll make the point now. It applies for all the reductions to workforce in terms of outside workers, both in terms of water and in terms of uh, the other areas, public works, et cetera. We have very successfully negotiated through collective bargaining a reduction in the size of the outside workforce by 43 positions. We have already implemented over 30 of that reduction with the remainder to follow. Uh, and therefore, we feel that we are very much underway. And this particular one has already been completed within St. John Water. You will find on the following slides and on this slide several comments about procurement. There are, there are many things that we can do to remove red tape, to streamline procurement processes, but only to a point. There is a procurement act and we must follow the requirements within the procurement act. Solid waste management, the first one on this slide, I'm proud to, uh, this was our idea as were many of these others and the pilot project will continue uh, in the next few months and we will move from there. The second one was also our idea, our idea uh, validated by Ernst & Young, balancing day and night shifts to make better use of our equipment. Um, and then the, the next one speaks about another aspect of fire. I will remind council that we already have your support to do a fire services review to address the rest of the recommendations uh, with regards to fire that are announced within the Ernst Young report. The bottom one is an interesting one. They, they are suggesting that we, re, we review some of the previous decisions of council in terms of land sales and some of them that were not supported by councils of the day because they still believe there's tremendous opportunity in that regard. Turning to the medium term initiatives, again, more comments about fire which will be taken care of in the fire services review more civilianization of the police force with the, which the police chief and the, and the board are working, are, excuse me, the police commission are working on. And this notion of divesting ourselves of several municipal buildings. We agree with this and the planning is underway, but we need to be cautious with this one. We have a very large geographic city and it's also a linear city. So again, to illustrate the point, if we were to go to one central depot for all of our public works vehicles, the challenge we would have is the sidewalk snowplow that travels only at 20 kilometers an hour would take a great amount of time to get to the sidewalks that it would have to plow within the city. So because of the nature of our geography, the notion of co-locating everything all together is a bridge too far, but certainly there is work we can do in this regard. Uh, again, uh, s several more about uh, procurement. Uh, I've already mentioned about that and the notion of uh, working with others to sell our lands. Uh, fleet, uh, fleet is under review now. We will be centralizing all of our assets under one fleet management system in 2021. Uh, the ABC reviews I've already spoken about. Some of the details are shown here on this slide and that work is underway. We can always get better in terms of our efficiency, for example, snowplow routes, et cetera. I'm happy to say that this council approved our purchase of AVL equipment last year, which where now we can track properly data, time spent on routes, et cetera. And if you recall, we already provided a briefing to this council on some of the inherent savings that we've already achieved because we have AVL within our fleet and those sorts of savings will continue.
Again, everything to do with fire is part of the fire services review. Longer term, some additional recommendations for police that are being looked at by the police commission. Uh, some of these have labor considerations and therefore will be part of the collective bargaining process as well. Uh, there is a clear recognition within Ernst & Young that we have done tremendous work in terms of making our buildings more green and finding efficiencies, and they cer are certainly encouraging that that work continues. We agree. Uh, and there is, uh, in the long term, on this slide and on the subsequent slides, uh, the St. John Water one at the bottom, this suggestion of regionalization of services and the value associated with regionalization of services if we can get that done. On this particular side, um, we believe that the consolidation of fleet with transit will be complete, certainly uh, within the next few years, and, we, and that work is underway. And uh, the whole issue of how many foremans we have, et cetera, and uh, whether we are making best use of them, that is ongoing work as well. Again, some more comments on fire. Um, there's an additional comment on police about how perhaps we could work better and in closer cooperation with the RCMP. There are some very real considerations there in terms of legislation and criminal requ uh, legal requirements that need to be worked through. So that is a longer term item. Again, here we speak more about procurement. We speak more about civilianization of certain elements within the police force. We do recognize the benefits of metering of residential water. We already meter commercial water, and that uh, is a significant capital investment, and therefore we do not view that happening in the next year or two, but it's certainly something that we are working on for the not too distant future. We are also working very hard to try to find some green funding from either the provincial or federal level to help with this initiative. In addition to those which are bucketed by long, medium, and short term, there are other recommendations that really don't fit nicely with a timeline. They are just ongoing um, ideas. The first one, of course, is uh, this notion of focus on the larger transformationals. Yes, we are focused there, but we also believe that we need to focus on the small stuff as well. Uh, medical calls. Uh, this notion of changing to a light vehicle for medical calls may have been overtaken by event because we have, uh, we have so significantly reduced the number of medical calls. So we'll have to wait and see how that unfolds uh, in the future. Um, another one where we believe an alternative approach is required, uh, the Ernst & Young report recommends a significant reduction in the number of our firefighters. We are reducing our firefighters this year. Any further reduction has to be uh, put in context of a fire services review. What Ernst & Young did was a mathematical calculation, uh, but, and they freely admit it within the report, that they did not do an exhaustive review and take a look at fire risk hazards, uh, NFPA standards, et cetera. Uh, so more work needs to be done there. Um, Saint, uh, another one in Ernst & Young is this notion of they believe that we could be in a better financial situation if we allowed St. John energy rates to be the same as NB power rates. We don't agree with that uh, and we are exploring alternative approaches for a dividend flow by growing St. John energy. Um, St. John water, again legally this is simply a non-starter. We cannot uh, make revenue or make profit from uh, St. John Water. The final one, and I'm sorry, these are all ones where, uh, as you can see, we, we're recommending alternative approaches. The final one is this notion of having a completely different staffing model for primarily our outside workers, but also some of our inside workers. It, uh, there are significant labor implications there, and quite frankly, we do not believe it is necessary. Well, we can achieve the efficiencies we need through other approaches than the one that Ernst & Young is recommending. Uh, and finally, 
Uh, they are talking about reducing our casual workforce by 25%. Quite frankly, we're almost there now because of our sustainability initiatives and any further reductions we don't agree with right now uh, because we have to see what the re reduction of the 43 full-time have in terms of an impact before we move forward on the casual, any further casual reductions. And this last one where we are uh, not supportive and want to take an alternative approach is the argument that foremen and subformen, uh, because they're part of the union, cannot effectively supervise. Uh, I don't believe that for a moment. There are other ways to ensure that our foremen and subformans are in fact doing what they need to do without taking them out of the union. It is an option. It is not the only option, and therefore we are exploring all the other ones as well. Okay, now turning to those sustainability enablers, things that apply throughout. Uh, they identified several sustainability enablers within the report. Uh, they were shown on that slide. Uh, binding arbitration work, we agree. Uh, binding arbitration has not uh, had the intended effect when the legislation was first introduced uh, in that arbitrators are not considering uh, a municipality's affordability for the wages that are being awarded. Uh, there is legislation in front of the Legislative Assembly and we are being told that uh, our current government wishes to pass it in the next sitting. Um, and therefore, uh, that is an issue that is ongoing but clearly beyond our control. The other notion they spoke about is if we, uh, if we don't like where collective bargaining is taking us, focus on shorter agreements instead of longer agreements. Uh, it's always an option, but of course that's an issue for collective bargaining. Um, examination of the labor relations environment in terms of having a clear understanding of where we are, what the associated risks and challenges are, will all form part of our 10-year labor relations strategy that I'll speak about in a moment. And in, in fact, on this slide, we need to have a plan for the long term, how we achieve what we need to achieve in terms of our workforce. That can only be done over the long term. And therefore, we are developing a 10-year labor relations strategy that will be presented in, uh, to Council. On this slide, they, they speak about strengthening the bargaining team. Uh, I'm quite confident with our bargaining team, but there's always improvements that can be made. They are suggesting that a labor lawyer be assigned permanently to our teams. We have access to labor lawyers as needed during collective bargaining. And quite frankly, uh, it is a cost that we simply could not afford to have them as dedicated members of bargaining teams when bargaining can last months, if not years. Uh, the Ernst Young report highlights uh, the importance of tax reform and also suggests that we continue with our advocacy efforts in that regard. And of course, we agree with that, and that is ongoing work. Uh, they did recommend within the report that we significantly reduce the minimum number within our outside workforce, and we have achieved that. And back to uh, the ABC is suggesting better reporting mechanisms, and that will form part of the ABC review. Uh, I'm winding down in terms of all of the various recommendations. We're almost at 75 at this point. They do recommend the completion of the strategic plan that has already been recommend, uh, ap approved in, uh, by Council for its development. Uh, they then talk about the single regional economic development agency, that it will take effect. Um, they talk about regional collaboration quite significantly and the potential value within it. We have tagged these as further due diligence required because of course we need to do a detailed analysis and quite frankly, we need to have detailed discussions with the other municipalities within the region on this. Um, but we are supportive of the notion of regionalization of services. Uh, they, they also talk to a degree about culture. Uh, we certainly agree with the comments. But culture is not changed overnight, and culture sometimes changes by doing some of the small stuff, and that's why we are focused on some of the small stuff. They do talk about the importance of measuring the results of our uh, initiatives, and again, of course, we agree there. They are suggesting, and uh, sorry, they did not suggest, but we are planning to have a biannual report to the Finance Committee on the five-year implementation plan of the Ernst & Young 
uh, and where we will talk about the work that has been completed and any adjustments that are required to the plan. We will then also provide an annual report to Council. Uh, for today, uh, since the task was for the City Manager to develop the implementation plan, we have done so. We had the supporting documents to, uh, to do so. so. Following your questions and comments, we are simply seeking a receive and file. So I have a motion on file to uh, move the receive and file and seconded by um, uh, Councillor Reardon. Uh, um, I'll go to, um, on the questions, some comments, concerns, please. Um, Anyone say, um, I'll go to uh, uh, Councillor, well actually, I have a few, I have a few um, the Mayor, yeah, I'll go to you I'll first, thanks Don, you. thank you. Mayor Darling, go ahead please. Oh sorry, I, I, I didn't know if uh, you were ready for me, thank you. Um, uh, thank you City Manager, I guess just before I, I share some comments, what, uh, so to receive and file for tonight, what are the next steps in the process uh, from, from, from there? How long before this will go to its next step? Um, the, the next step for us is we put pen to paper in terms of a specific implementation plan that will be released by the city manager for action by the, uh, by the staff. Uh, also, on a yearly basis, uh, I produce a work plan for the staff that highlights the priorities for the year. And what we have said we would do within this will be reflected within those work, within those work plan documents on a yearly basis. Those will be made available to Council as they are developed. Uh, and again, there will be the biannual reporting to Finance Committee and the yearly report to Council on our progress on this on these uh, initiatives. Okay, but sorry, City Manager, specific to what you presented tonight is the intention for us to absorb this, and it's going to come to it's going to come to council, or is it? Are, are you presenting this as that's that's the plan? Uh, well, uh, Your Worship, I, I I believe I'm presenting this as the City Manager's implementation plan for Ernst and Young, clearly. At any point, either at a council meeting or in any other discussions, I'm certainly receptive, as is the rest of the staff, to comments, observations, and adjustments that uh, council or members of council, individual members of council, may want us to take a look at. Um, but because it's a city manager implementation plan, I was not planning on seeking approval, per se, of the plan, just comments and focus areas or adjustments that you, you may want to see within it. Uh, okay, thank you, City Manager. I guess uh, from my perspective, uh, uh, I would have expected that the plan would come back to Council, something this um, significant would come back to Council for, uh, for approval. Um, uh, um, I would have a whole series of comments. Uh, I guess I'll offer them up uh, just fairly quickly here. Um, so uh, when I look at the plan, first of all, thank you to you and everyone else. It's a significant amount of work that you've gone through. Um, I, you know, started out reading it, trying to absorb it here this afternoon, uh, looking through the lens of the, the citizens that, that we represent, um, we all represent, but uh, certainly as a council member, you know, and just thinking about a few things. First of all, um, you know, how, how does the organization, which is, you know, you've touched on in many areas in this report, become even more strategic, goal-oriented, goal and driven by by metrics that matter, open, transparent, and, and, and you've driven a lot of change to be even more customer focused. So, you know, we've set a lot of targets in our financial plan, our long-term financial plan, but I, I think we also have to um, achieve more flexibility in our budgets that we do have. So it's the chicken and the egg. We don't have money, you know, my argument has been, well, we do. We have $158 million today. Uh, and hopefully we have more growth in the future. Uh, so I certainly would like to see you have more flexibility in your budget or council uh, in their next budget to direct dollars to be invested differently. More flexibility, I think, is one of the areas I was looking for um, out of this. Uh, you know, we, we should have that, I would suspect. We also, I guess, when I read this, 
I think there are some areas, and perhaps you can point point back. Uh, I I perhaps missed it, but I think there are some areas that need more urgent implementation, in particular with COVID and the unknowns that we face. Like I, uh, you know, four and five years for some of these areas, I just think is a very very long timeline. So I'm just concerned about some of the timeline. In particular, I think, and you mentioned it, but I didn't I didn't pick up on it. But performance management for the corporation, so effectiveness, efficiency innovation, I think, has to be the cornerstone of a 2021 work plan. Uh, uh, we didn't have a long-term financial plan. We do now. We didn't have financial policies. We do now. And we don't have an effectiveness and performance management program in the city. Um, so I think that has to be uh, uh, fully implemented. Uh, I know it's a big, a big task, so I'd love to hear when I'm done here uh, where, where that is in the work plan. I think governance uh, is, is a critical focus area for not only the organization, council, management, boards. And I know you, you've got an agency board and commission review underway, but, but you know, we have major commissions that are operating that um, I, I think there's a, there's a need for a deep review of governance in particular around the same urgency around their sustainability. And I'm talking about, in some cases, $25 million uh, uh, units like the police commission. Uh, the labor relations piece, I think we've been certainly talking about it in this entire term and probably many council terms before. It's about $85 million of wages and benefits in our budget. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, I know we're going to have a labor relations strategy, but that's an area that I think is, uh, is game changing and perhaps requires some uh, some uh, more permissible uh, closed session discussion around that. Um, I, I'm not sure we know yet, and perhaps through the strategic planning exercise, we'll get at what success looks like to help the city grow and thrive. And then lastly, around benchmarking, I think it's um, it's critical, and I, you know, I, I agree with you that uh, not all organizations necessarily include the same costs, but that perhaps is one of the exercises we take on. Maybe we get uh, municipalities in this region or in Atlantic Canada to agree to a standardized benchmarking, but I don't believe it should only be against other municipalities. I think it should also be against the private sector. And even more imp importantly, you know, I, I think we need to frame up that local reality of affordability and what that means for us in the city of St. John. So, you know, that I don't, you didn't dismiss benchmarking at all. I, I'm not saying you did. I just think that's critical. So um, I'd have a lot more comments. I guess, city manager, I, I thought we were literally receiving and filing it for tonight. But if I were to summarize it, uh, you know, I think um, uh, some more urgency in some areas. I wasn't clear on where the performance management piece was. So in particular, the big buckets around our costs uh, are where I'm most concerned and, and, I, and I, I want to be more certain on where they, they end up in the work plan. Thank you. Understood, Your Worship. Um, I guess the first general comment I'll make is um, a lot of what needs to be done in terms of the major transformational changes, um, quite frankly, most of our workforce has nothing to do with that work. The work we're talking about within Ernst & Young and the work we're talking about in terms of the transformational changes resides in a much smaller percentage of the overall employee workforce. And uh, as city manager, and I've been in many organizations, I could tell you that the senior management team, the strategic thinkers, and the managers at the various levels that are involved in this work incredibly long hours already. Uh, we have had a very aggressive work plan in 2020 and we've accomplished almost everything and that was before COVID hit and, and we still managed to pull it off. So I understand your comments about sooner is better, uh, but in, I, I do need to balance that with overall workload and capacity of the team. And quite frankly, there's not a whole lot of money to go out and contract out this work. And certainly our experience has been when you contract out strategic work, you spend just as much time on it anyway, working with the contractors. That said, to put your mind at ease to a certain degree, I can give you some of the major ticket items that will be in the 2021 work plan 
based on the Ernst & Young report, but also based on our own understanding of what is important, what the community is asking for, and what our role is as a municipal government. Um, so some of the key items that you will see in the 2021 work plan, we are developing an entire performance management framework. Most people don't understand what that means, but that's everything from defining objectives and key performance indicators to embracing a culture of um, um, data matters, uh, tracking that data, measuring that data, drawing conclusions from that data. We will also put together a continuous improvement framework. And that is much more than just deciding that we're going to do a project to reduce waste within City Hall. It's everything from um, what sort of cultural changes do we need to have whereby everybody embraces this notion. I think we're halfway there now that we need to improve each and every day. Um, but that's a mentality thing. You then need to have the tools associated with it. Uh, in terms of ability to measure, uh, a structure for discussion of results, et cetera. So the continuous improvement framework will be developed in 2021. With those two in place, we need to take a look at our performance evaluation framework and talk about how we evaluate our workers, our staff, and how we can improve on that. We have the strategic plan that has already been briefed to this committee and to council that needs to occur uh, in 2021. We have the 10-year labor relations strategy that needs to be completed in 2021. And we have to complete the review on all of the ABCs and its associated uh, uh, things such as reporting mechanisms, et cetera, in 2021. That's on top of all the normal work, the day-to-day -day routine stuff. Uh, I'm sure there's more that will end up on the 2021 work plan, but that, Your Worship, is already very aggressive and there's, quite frankly, only so much that can be achieved. I could promise more, but I'm pretty sure I couldn't deliver more. Very well. So one quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, City Manager. I'm, not, I'm absolutely not looking for you to promise more. I'm, I, I guess it wasn't clear to me. Your verbal summary um, was more clear. I just didn't. So I'm glad to hear the performance management, the other pieces. I agree with what you said. Uh, I have heard performance management, I've heard labor relations strategy, I've heard continuous improvement framework. I just didn't see that as clearly and as succinctly as you just said it, and absolutely not looking to, for you to promise more. In fact, I support you in cutting, cutting things off and support you in having the right resources uh, and not necessarily put the, putting it always on the, on the shoulders of your, uh, your A team and your small team. Uh, that, that's, what, that's what I mean by flexibility for you in the budget. So uh, uh, thanks for that clarity. Very well. Councillor Reardon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a quick comment. It's a good report. It doesn't have any surprises, as the city manager said, commissioned by the province in order to uh, do an operational audit for St. John to help with our financial, getting our finances in order, et cetera. And I will say it's always easy to clean someone else's house. It's easy to throw things out. It's easy to whittle the budget down. It's easy to do those things in someone else's house. So for me, at the end of the day, I guess I'll be looking, this isn't written in stone for me. At the end of the day, I'll be looking for staff who are gonna work on this and will understand at the grassroots level, the impacts. And for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So you need to know what the impacts are as we go forward. A lot of these impacts are gonna be very positive and we may run up against some that just won't work for us. I'm very receptive to switching gears on anything that the, that the that staff feels is not for St. John. So um, I guess that's about, I mean, there's a lot that's already happened. You've got 46 out of 75 that are already started or completed. I think that's huge. When you look at the end, I mean, make informed decision, collect data, you know, that's, there's the no brainer there. I'd like to see performance management though. I'd like to see council look at that for us as a team as well. I think that would be very beneficial as well. And um, like I said, Ernst & Young won't be around for the sting of some of the impacts of this. So I think we need to make sure that we're making the right moves for St. John. Thank you. Very well. Any, any other, uh, Councillor Sullivan, please. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, just for, anybody who's keeping score and, and, and concerned about reports that stay on the shelf, 
Um, this is part of sustaining St. John, a three-part plan. And, you know, ultimately that report and agreement that we have with the provincial government, the province paid for the audit. That was part, their part of this. And we are following through with the items that are, that are in it. And that's our part of it. So uh, just, you know, really this is part of an even bigger picture and just want to mention it for those who, who may be watching and listening um, that we continue to work that we continue to work that agreement with the province and, and uh, sustaining St. John a three part plan is alive and well and continues to be worked on. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, uh, Councillor Sullivan. I was going to say something similar that, um, that uh, first of all, thank you city manager and staff for the work you've done so far. I, I was a little taken back seeing uh, a date as far as 2024 out here. I understand it takes um, uh, time and resources and, and, uh, and I know that you're very busy and staff's very busy. Um, but I'll echo what Councillor Sullivan just said. Here's a report that was, uh, that was uh, commissioned, paid for by the province that is not sitting on a shelf. It's being implemented, all right? And uh, I might wish that it all gets magically done tomorrow. It's not going to happen, but however, we're doing what's in this report. So I think it services in two fronts very well. The efficiencies we, we've, we've garnered off this report and the relationships and, and transparencies with our par partners at the, um, at the province of New Brunswick. So, um, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Norton, I didn't see you, sir, sorry. No, no, that's, uh, that's fine, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I, if there's, uh, it's along the same uh, wavelength as has already been mentioned, if there's, as we work, uh, as we work through this work plan, so to speak, if there's a way of um, communicating that with uh, the, the Minister of Local Government and his office that we're, we're continuing on with the work despite, the, uh, despite the, the ministerial change in that office, I think that that would be prudent and could come from uh, the chairman himself uh, or through council after it's been, been ratified through that body that um, here's here's some here's some updates just on uh, on some letterhead to keep that keep that going. I, I don't think it hurts. Not sure it will um, do more than what's already been done, but I think uh, it it does show goodwill, and uh, and it shows that we're putting some sweat equity into the uh, into the report that's uh, been uh, been commissioned on the uh, on the provincial dime, and obviously to the good work of our. Uh, of our of our city staff i i mean there's do i have is there comments i could get into the weeds but i'll save those for uh for for council when it when it comes to it i think there's things that we all agree with and disagree with but um one thing i would highlight and i know his worship has already mentioned it um, as it relates to the benchmarking piece um as long as i've been on council benchmarking is has been um has been a, a common theme um, and the difficulty with benchmarking in the in the mun in in the municipal environment, um, given the fact that uh, municipalities, um, villages, towns, LSDs are so different and um, and so varied in terms of how they how they measure and define um, specific services and how they uh, build out their costs. Um, you know that's a that's a challenge, and so maybe we we look at the uh, we uh, we we go about that problem looking at the um, I guess from a from a you know an endpoint back saying if there was a way um, and, and maybe it's the mayor himself that that looks at this um, at Moncton and Fredericton that they all come to a common definition of exactly what it costs and what's inputted into um, paving streets. Um, I, don't, I don't see that as being a, a huge, as a huge problem that they all come to the same definition of that. Here's what we input into paving one kilometer of street so that um, it benefits Moncton and it benefits Fredericton and it benefits St. John when we come to benchmarking and comparing costs at the end, I see one person being um, put at the advantage and, and that's the taxpayer and oftentimes that's who we have to keep in mind. So um, if, we can, if we can move our own definitions aside and come to a, a common understanding of, uh, of, of, of how we define those costs, I think that would be beneficial so that we can do um, exactly what the city manager said was a challenge 
and that's comparing apples to apples. Let's come up with an apples to apples definition of some of those um, costs that continue to escalate and rise and create um, um, create challenges for us to provide um, you know premium services that are otherwise at a premium cost. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reardon. You're something to add. Thanks. Uh, can I just quickly say, it, I found it was interesting in the report that they recommended that we strengthen our um, bargaining team. And I mean, who wouldn't hire a Philadelphia lawyer if you could afford one? So I think that might be something that the province might want to look at, or we could recommend that they provide that uh, exclusive expertise for, um, for all the municipalities and that, that service could be rotated around to whoever needed it. It's un unreasonable. I mean, this report is to look at how can we, I guess, reduce our costs. That would be one that would certainly increase our costs. And as the city manager said, there's no way you could afford it because bargaining goes on for months sometimes. So that might be interesting. The province could certainly pick that up for us yeah. and offer that for all of us. Anyways, just, it, it just that's just struck me in that report <laughs> when I read it. Thank you. You respond, City Councilor? Uh, uh, your City Manager? Uh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I, I may have misrepresented this a little bit in terms of how, how I, the words I used. Um, I'm quite confident right now, as we speak, that our bargaining teams, and it's never the same, um, most of our bargaining sessions, in fact, all of them right now are being led by our Commissioner of HR, but we create a bargaining team for the situation that we present uh, that we are faced with. Uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable that between the members that are in the room, and we have very senior members in the room, we have commissioner level representation from the service areas on those bargaining teams, but between that team, our entire HR department, our entire finance department that crunches the numbers in terms of ideas that are floated around in collective bargaining, but we also have behind that a dedicated if you will, on, return, on retainer legal advice. Um, and we, ha we, depending on the circumstance, we put other experts on retainer as well. So I believe we're already achieving what Ernst & Young was suggesting within the report. They just didn't see that because of the, the, the period of time they were here. But the, notion, the, the specific recommendation of putting a labor lawyer on the team in the room, well, first of all, that goes contrary to what collective bargaining teams normally are. The lawyers aren't normally in the room. But secondly, that's just an unaffordable option. I will also mention that our uh, bargaining teams do work very closely uh, with Tri-City uh, in terms of discussions and uh, approaches, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I wouldn't want to overplay what Ernst & Young is recommending. I think we're already doing most of it. Uh, but the notion of permanently putting a lawyer in the room is just an unaffordable option. our strength for bargaining. Yeah. And I know that because I've talked to you about that before. And, uh, but I just found the report, if, you know, reading that as the public, then I would, I would believe that you did not have the team in place. Yeah, and I guess if I was to word it another way, I could ask Commissioner McGovern, uh, Commissioner Fudge, or Commissioner HR who leads the team, whether they ever found that they were missing that legal advice, and I, I believe the answer would be no. It was there when we needed it. Yep. Thanks. All right. Thanks to all. Um, I'm going to wrap it up, please. Uh, there is a motion on the floor. I, I, I hope uh, at the uh, not too distant future we can perhaps we can uh, update council with a, maybe a, perhaps a shorter version and also the province as to our progress. So, again, motion on the floor. I call for the vote, please. All those in favor, and opposed carried. Thank you so much. Final item of the evening is 1-6, uh, credit card fees. Um, Mr. Levine, are you going to help us out with that one again, please? Okay. This report is just more for information purposes. Uh, the Finance Committee approved uh, Back in late 2017, uh, um, 
the use of a convenience fee on any online credit card payments or telephone payments, and that amount was 1.75%. Uh, we are now in a position to uh, implement those fees and our goal uh, was going to be for January 1st, 2021. Now, obviously, with the, the recent cyber attack, we are having issues with our online system. But, however, we do want to proceed with that uh, and we are ready to uh, implement that once our online systems are up and running. Um, and we anticipate the annual savings will be around $75,000 a year. Uh, and the majority of that is related to water payments. Um, so the, the utility will see the, uh, the benefit of that. And, uh, and again, that's for all our online or telephone credit card payments. And this is in line with St. John Energy, MP Power, um, universities uh, have a convenience fee. So uh, again, this is more of a, just a, an information for the, uh, the finance committee because we will be rolling out some communications around that. Uh, as well as um, updating our website whenever that's uh, fully functional as well. And with right. that, any questions? Yes, I'll go to, I saw Councillor Sullivan first. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, a quick question. Uh, do we have a handle on, on overall, do most people pay using a credit card or do most people pay in some sort of cash and equivalent? I, I would say it's cash and equivalent. Okay. But it's, you know, the, the options there to pay with credit cards, so the people that want to, you know, bank points and, and whatnot yes. will certainly use that. But we, I mean, we do have a lot of customers that are on pre-authorized, which it costs, doesn't cost the utility any money for people that are paying through their bank or online, so. Very good. I guess, just a suggestion, um, where possible, just from a marketing perspective, I, I guess for me, I'd rather see it, not to not charge the fee, um, but I'd rather see it as a discount for cash as opposed to a premium for credit cards, if you know what I mean. Like that way it doesn't look like we're sticking somebody with another fee. We're incentivizing people to pay with cash. Um, we're, I'm just gonna float it out there and leave it with you wherever possible. That yeah, yeah. And, and that's a fair comment. And, and you know, we've had that discussion and we sort of take the approach. Uh, the majority of it uh, is for water bills. And so I look at it, the, the rate payers who choose to pay by pre-authorized payment is subsidizing people who choose to pay by credit cards online or telephone. So, yeah, I, I, I do agree with you, though. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Reardon. Mr. Chairman. So, Craig, right now, the uh, merchant fees, are they paid for by each department, or does the city pay for them as one unit? We adjust them out to each each, each department. Okay. So then each department will get the, reap, in, reap the benefit of That's the correct. fees. That's and, correct. And, and like I said in the report, the, the majority uh, is is the utility and then the you know the smaller part is the parking tickets so what uh, how much would it be on an annual basis then you're say, going to save 75,000 yeah for for people coming into uh, into our space and online or telephone it's about $180,000 a year so we're you know we're not quite half but we're there and i'm assuming that not quite half but but i'm assuming the percentage oh and of course it'll change as more people but that it would be the average percent that most people would charge most municipalities or uh, that's correct they're just they're really just recovering yeah. a fee we're not making any money this isn't a uh, we're just we're right. really recovering You're trying a fee to recover that we're paying it, sure. by taking yeah. that credit okay. card yeah thanks yeah are we totally recovering it uh, Craig? No. Oh, well it ranges from 1.2 to 1.75 1.8 so I, I would say that yeah we're well we'll be recovering the majority of our fees for sure any other questions concerns all right, there is a recommendation there. Would someone move it? And it was just a receipt file. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Reardon. Seconded by uh, Councillor Norton. All those in favor and those opposed, motion carried. That's the final item for this evening. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for your attendance and uh, wearing your masks here and complying to COVID. It's all um, different times. Good evening. Move adjournment and seconded. All those in favor? Hi, folks. Thank you. Adjourned. <laughs>